This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to provide medical advice. It exists only to entertain. Also, this episode will deal with some true crime stories involving sex workers and the mention of abortion, so do with that information what you will. In 1891, in upstate New York, a man walks into a chemical supply storefront in Saratoga, New York. Hello there. Good afternoon. Welcome to Al's Chemical Supply Depot. Our athletes are more than basic. How can I help you? Yes, well, I'm in the market for some uh, some soap. Well, we don't have soap, but we got a lot of basic chemicals. You could probably use them to make your own. Oh, well, sure. I'll take some of those. Some of what? Which chemicals? Um, soap chemicals? Hey, man, do you care to name a few? Hmm, lavender? Oh, man, that's a scent. Uh, you know, never mind the soap. I'll just get that elsewhere. Um, do you happen to have any chloroform? Sure do. How much do you need? Mm, a few bottles, I guess. All right. I imagine you'll like to see my credentials, of course. Nah, it's not necessary. Oh, oh, really? Yeah, it's the 1890s. There's no laws or regulations or anything like that. Oh, well, excellent. Will that be all? Oh, you know, while I'm here, do you, do you know where I can buy some rags? How big do you need? I mean, like, you know, like about face size rags? Nah, I'd go to the general store down the road. Excellent, excellent. Okay. Oh, oh, I'm I'm running low on on arsenic. Do you have some of that? Sure do. Elemental or well, well, whatever's easiest to ingest. What? Oh, nothing, nothing. I mean, I mean, you, you know what? Never mind the arsenic. Oh, okay. So just the chloroform then. Yes. Oh, wait. I forgot. Oh, let me get it here. The missus sent me with a list. Ah, uh, she did. Did she? Yep. Got it right here. That's right. Let's see. I'll need. Uh, 500 strychnine pills, too. Whoa there. What are you going to do with those? Uh, we've, we've got a rat problem. So you're going to give them pills? Uh, yep. Yeah, that's about what we're going to do. You do realize that that's enough strychnine to kill lots of people, right? Oh, is it toxic to people? I had no idea. Yeah, very. Oh, it is. Okay, wow. Uh, I'll tell her to be careful with it, then. For the rats. Rats, yes, exactly. All right, seems to be on the level. I'll ring these up. Great, good. Well, uh, looks like I'm all set. All right, that about does it. Here's your chloroform and your 500 strychnine pills for your wife. They're uh, uh, our rat problem, yes. Yeah, well, I hope it does a trick for you and your wife. You know, what did you say your name was again? Her? Oh, well, I didn't, but her name is... Uh, Gretchenella. Mm -hmm. Gretchenella. It sounds like you made that up on the spot. Nope, nope. It's a real name. Her people are, are Dutch, you know. Uh, all right. That explains it. Okay. Well, time for me to go then. Uh, where did you say I can buy those rags for the chloroform? Yeah, it's down that way. General store. Well, I'll, I'll head there next to continue making completely legal purchases of things. Great. Off you go. For historians, for historians, for historians. We look at cases through our history. It's just Max in there and Mac and me. You gotta listen, you don't have to read. Welcome, everyone. This is Poor Historians, a podcast delving into the archives of medical history. As three emergency physicians, we will explore the unusual ailments, treatments, physicians, and all related material having to do with the healing arts. I'm Max, and I'm joined here by my good friends and colleagues, Aaron and Mike. Gentlemen, are you ready for the medicine meets true crime crossover that you know you always wanted? Wait, what's medicine meat? <laughs> Valentine's nice. meat juice. Go back nice. to the episode. Ooh, oh, that's nice. right. Yeah, I love meat juice. <laughs> mm. uh, we see a lot of true crime, actually, right? I mean, yeah. sort of, yeah, not unusual. 
And we are kind of detectives. This is more individual bit. crimes, though. This isn't like crimes against humanity, even when when the intention might have been good. Yeah, true. I'm still looking forward to my medicine meats. Mm. <laughs> shout outs. Uh, I have a completely non-self-serving shout out, but it does go to the three-time back-to-back-to-back, three-peat, D-level, beer league, hockey phenomenon known as the Bombers. This team, of which I should say I am a member, has been listening to, supporting, and telling everyone they know about the show from the beginning. So it is probably about time that they receive some props for that. And I'm sure they're responsible for at least some degree of our audience expansion. I appreciate it. Gentlemen who definitely weren't salty about not having a shout out to this day. <laughs> <laughs> I played with the Bombers for, was it a couple games? I think you did one, you did one um, summer season, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah. And I remember there was a, there was a play. This is for all the hockey fans out there. I, I think I just, it might've been the first game and nobody knew, like, you never know how good someone is when they, they come in and for yeah, some well, you're reason, you're a new I guy played, to the team. That's yeah, a team that's I, been together for years at that point. So yeah. Yeah. And I played really well that game and I remember coming into the zone and I can't remember, you know, one of the guys had the puck and I opened up at the top of the circle and I got a pass right on the stick you know, go top corner goal. And I think from that moment on, everyone thought I was way better than I was. And that just like <laughs> freakishly happened. Like there's no way I could do it again. <laughs> oh, they, they still tell tales of that story. <laughs> That's all we talk about every game oh. more or less. Well, my hockey team always talks about Max and how, remember that game you played for us that you, you stopped like, I don't know, probably 200 shots no <laughs> it was a lot of shots I would... it was like and everyone's like holy crap that guy's good well fortunately that was back when i was playing goalie and fortunately thanks to my long-standing term playing on the bombers team i as their goalie at one point before we were the three peat back to back to back to back champions i took a lot lot of shots so i got pretty good at goaltending as it were and uh, i was able to translate that over to your team and you're welcome. Yes. Thank you. So with those positive vibes cast out there, maybe Seth can get off my back and stay out of the penalty box or avoid going off sides all the time. Just saying, buddy. Any uh, any other shout outs you guys can think of? I want to shout out to all the listeners out there. Nice and direct. <laughs> I like it. Well thank you cultivated. For <laughs> listening. Thank you for, uh, thank you for having ears. For that. Yes, we appreciate that. Well, all right. you don't know. For- it's a global show. Maybe some <laughs> earless people listening. Max. Okay. Okay. Wow. Let's move on. All right. So for today's episode, we are going to return a bit to the popular era of medical history for a true crime involving a very unscrupulous physician whose evil deeds did span a few different continents, countries, and his eventual capture was really frighteningly delayed given given the obvious nature of some of his crimes, but there's a charming angle of old-timey illegal screw-ups and oversights that is at least partially to blame. So it wasn't because this guy was a particularly good criminal, I can assure you of that, but we will we will get through it as we are here. So a note, I am going to refer to him either as Thomas, as Neil, or Dr. Neil, because that is how the newspapers of his time did refer to him. His full name is actually Dr. Thomas Neil Cream, and considering this story will veer into the <laughs> world of murder and sex work, there's no way I'm going to repeat Dr. Cream over and over again. <laughs> you, I can literally see Mike's gears turning right now. Can't wait. I wonder why the papers did that. I'm muting you. Is that like a, a convention? They're like, there's no way we can put Dr. Cream. On I think page. we need to That's... not oh, well you know here. What? We should uh, mm-hmm. reach out to um, Grey's Anatomy and see if they could write in a new character and make and call him Dr. <laughs> Creamy. <laughs> There's Dreamy. Is, that a right? Dr. Dreamy? is it Dreamy or isn't there a McFlurry? Dr. McFlurry. Dreamy and McDreamy. Dreamy. And McDreamy. Dreamy. Dreamy. Yeah. And creamy. <laughs> you know, somehow that was surprisingly more G-rated than I thought it was going to yeah. be. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm well done. Doing my You're best. Yeah. You know, my, my thought is like if you could make some jokes that are out of the gutter, it means you you might actually have some like comedic skill. Okay. If you just say penis and poop and yeah, B- vagina. Other words that I have to <laughs> yeah bleep out later. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. All right. So we're going to talk about Doctor Neil, as it were. Creamy. Thomas Neil Cream. 
I'll refer to him fully here at the beginning, was born on May 27, 1850 in Glasgow, Scotland. And four years later, his father, William Cream, I suppose, took a job as a manager of a shipbuilding and lumber firm outside of Quebec City in Canada. So going across the pond there. Thomas, or Dr. Neal as it will be, was not so good at his father's trade, however. And so though he does apprentice for several years during those those type of years in your formative life, he doesn't really amount to much of a lumber person or ship builder. So what else do you do in 1872? You got nothing else? Go to a medical school. Did his, uh, his brother Richard Cream take over the wood business? <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying that he wasn't good at laying wood, Dr. Cream? I expect that from Mike and not from Aaron. It was really good, though. <laughs> <laughs> Reasonable. <laughs> All right. I'll t- I'm sorry. Reset. Oh boy. What else can a young man do? As I said, he went to medical school. So he goes to McGill University in Montreal. He is there on a full hockey scholarship. He what, what? excels in French poetry. No, seriously? Lies. <laughs> that is. Two. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that was. That was, was ice a, hockey even a thing in the 1800s? You know, I, I'm oh, not going to claim goodness. to know Maybe the they... entire history of ice hockey but i know that one of the earliest stanley cups was at the turn of the 20th century i am sure that this 1872 period is around the time that it's being appropriated from i believe indigenous cultures that oh wow the... more of a form that's not the focus of this podcast to know hockey history but i am well, embarrassed that the... i don't know more about it first recorded public hockey game was actually in Montreal's Victoria skating rink in 1875 between two teams of McGill university students. No way. That's so, what Google says. Did I fail so. correctly into an almost true joke? Yeah. Yes. It's yeah. funny. Yeah. Cause yeah. hockey actually means hockey means stands with two fists. Native no, it doesn't. <laughs> <That's, that's, laughs> you know, those, uh, what dances with wolves, right? Stands with a <laughs> fist was the name that they gave yeah. them. Anywho, it was uh, a fighting joke. So Dr. Neal is noted for being very stylish, having lots of money and liking to show that off. And well, his dad had lots of money, so therefore he had lots of money. And he has a reputation for proudly displaying his wealth and going about as kind of a big shot. And he graduates from McGill actually with honors, with merits, uh, and does quite well in that respect. At the commencement address, I like this little tidbit, He did give it on a topic of, quote, the evils of malpractice in the medical profession, end quote. Given one might see this address as the newly minted Dr. Neal giving his classmates advice as they head out into the world of medical practice, let's just put a pin of irony in this little moment for later. What what malpractice was in 1872? Don't sew them in half. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the bar, (laughs) the threshold for malpractice is probably really high. I, what we've read you could do anything that would be anybody. an interesting history topic when did that start becoming a like, yeah. cultural norm you know truly like yeah phineas gage gets a tamping rod through his head and the doctor's poking his finger in the hole and <laughs> like like nowadays probably that's be like, standard hey, probably of care should. yeah dr cream uh, <laughs> if you've been treated by him uh reach out to this law firm because if he stuck his <laughs> finger in a hole in your head you might be entitled to retribution Retribution? Restitution. <laughs> both may In this time period, I think <laughs> retribution was actually a legal entity. Well, he wrote his thesis on the effects of chloroform in case there weren't enough red flags in the story. <laughs> it's just, nice. Yeah, yeah, it's like sketchy, the resume right here. Right there in the open, isn't it? I feel like he's yeah, gaslighting absolutely. us. Yeah. <laughs> well, this brings us to a young lady named Flora Eliza Brooks. So just after graduation, she meets and is seduced by Dr. Neal. And... Can I just ask a quick question? Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it's a formality. In history, it seems like everybody's referred to with their three names formally. Mm-hmm. But there were way less people. There were actually band. way fewer people. Well, there are way fewer people. <laughs> Thank I you, Max. I, I can't unhear it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, is it? normal for this time because everybody's referred to as three names and i just feel like there are far fewer people on the planet but it, it, it's just, most likely just a formality rather than i mean like, i'm guessing so it's also if you're writing about it you tend to be more formal than speaking about it so it might be why it seems that way okay. as you're yeah. looking back mm-hmm. what it really means is all three of us need third names well, yeah. i have three names i just don't refer to myself with the three but now yeah. i guess you could have a unique hashtag so you don't really need three names you could just have like <laughs> You know, uh, ED Doc 69. 
Like, you know that that's me. <laughs> I would assume it was. So, oh, yes. uh, Flora, her father happens to own a fancy hotel in Waterloo, Quebec. And as Flora is uh, dating, courting, or being courted by, I should say, Dr. Neil, she becomes pregnant. And Dr. Neil ends up performing an abortion. So there are definitely two things to note here. One is that I never said Flora and Neil were married at this point, right? Not a big deal to me or really in the modern age, but it's certainly different culturally back then in the mid to late 18th century. And uh, the second point is that abortion was illegal in Canada at the time and somehow still happened, which seems strange, right? Mm. Anywho, she becomes ill following the procedure. So does a procedure. She becomes, it sounds like almost deathly ill at that point. I don't know whether it was infection, blood loss, or what happened there. But her father was not happy, to say the least. He goes to confront Dr. Neal with a firearm. And as a result, Dr. Neal feels a little bit compelled to marry Flora. And he does so. And it's not really clear if it's right there on the spot or it was like the next day, but it happened very soon after the gun was put in his face. Yeah. Isn't isn't this the phrase shotgun wedding? Isn't that what it means? Mm. Mm. This, is probably, a pistol it, this wedding. is probably a musket. It's yeah. musket wedding. <laughs> musket wedding. Maybe a rifle. Could be a rifle at this time. It'd be new if he had some he money. He's standing in the entryway, like, packing lock. powder in the Match front of lock? his musket with a long rod. He's like, I'm going to get you. <laughs> Got one shot. You're going to marry Flora, and if you don't marry Flora, you're going to marry Fauna. <laughs> wow. That's a good line. Off the top. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what? Off the cuff, I'll give you that one. Yeah. Uh, but is this, this is upstate New York, so that they didn't sound like... No, no, this is... No, this is in, oh, this is in Montreal. Quebec. Up, oh, boy. We There's have probably a lot day. of ha-ha-ha's. <laughs> oh, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> like their greeting so apparently after the wedding he uh dr neil decided you know what i need a little bit of me space i'm gonna go check out london england and he does so he goes to london england to continue his medical studies and uh well his wife and her family never saw him again go figure (laughs) just go some mm -hmm, yep before it was cool so even though flora recovered from the post-procedural illness the basically she developed either bronchitis or tuberculosis the following year in 1877 and ultimately died from that it's not really clear what the condition was but while that part of the story i don't know may not be unusual for the time given how easy it was to be a scumbag that had money and you could just pop off to another part of the world it should be noted that thomas who certainly was an obviously devoted absentee husband with a medical degree in pharmaceutical knowledge was apparently prescribing or sending her some medication to help with the cough and told her not to take anything mm. else mm. Now, mm. now eventually her doctor becomes suspicious of this fact uh and that dr neil may have been possibly almost definitely i would say involved here yeah, but never followed through with his hunch. And so her her personal physician later said, you know what? I think it was probably foul play, but he never was able to do anything about it in the meantime or just never did anything about it. So <laughs> Dr. Neil goes on uh, while he's over in uh, London, England, to complete training with the Royal Colleges of Physicians and Surgeons in Edinburgh in 1878. And then he returns to London, Ontario, just to be even more confusing when you're reading like three <laughs> different articles about this as to where in the world he is. So we return to Canada at this point, and he starts his career as a physician in private practice back in London, Canada. Wait, where, where's Ontario compared to? Is that the same province? Sorry, Canadians. I apologize uh-huh. to all Canadians. Wait, <laughs> did you just ask if Ontario was the same province as Quebec? If London is the same. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. Yes, don't, <laughs> don't hate me. Please reply to Aaron with your complaints. No, so definitely a different province. Uh, the one north and uh, east of uh, Detroit, Michigan. Here we go. Oh, yeah. See, there at least. Where Ontario uh, is. <laughs> it's also the one that's closest to me, so you'd think mm-hmm. I would know. Mm-hmm. My favorite is Saskatchewan. Uh, uh, yes, Saskatchewan. I think it's from Strange Brew. Oh, definitely. I, yeah. Well, also, it's got the most memorable capital. What's the capital? Regina. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even kidding. It's, uh, no, you're not. I'm sorry, Canada. <laughs> All right. Well, we're back in London, <laughs> Canada, and uh, that's London, Ontario. And so Dr. Neil's off in doing his medical practice thing. And it's off to a rousing start because considering he managed to gather patients to his office, despite the fact that very early in this career, he is charged with 
pleading guilty to practicing without a license under Ontario's Medical Act. He has not stopped at any point and he's able to continue. <laughs> doing, is, doing is this around thing. the time you could just like write your own license and Name. say, I'm, yeah, okay. Like I did in the back room. Yeah, it's <laughs> the one that's hanging on your wall with the crayon. No, mm-hmm. the one that I printed up that said that I'm the premier diagnostician. Yeah. Oh, that was that it's signed. signed. It's even yeah. signed. Yeah. The governor nice. and the mayor. <laughs> For the listener, uh, Mike gave himself an award that he printed out and put in the office at work that mm-hmm. on a cursory glance could almost look legitimate. <laughs> yeah. And then you look at it more, you look who received it and you're going, wait a second. No, wait. I was so mad. He read that. He's like, how did you get that? Why did the governor <laughs> sign it? I was like, I printed it off my computer. Nice. <laughs> it's still up uh, in the office. I know. It's, it's pretty amazing. So, one year into said practice, in 1879, one of his patients named Catherine Hutchinson Gardner was found dead in the privy behind his office. A bottle of chloroform with a chloroform-soaked rag was found with her. I do think crimes were much easier to commit in the age before fingerprints were used in criminal justice, but this seems just, really like he's not trying. Just left not the bottle all. with the rag. Like he wants somebody to, to find. Yeah. Oh, it's, my God. I mean, aside from the human tragedy, it's almost comedically keystone cop type yeah. crime. Yeah, well, it's right? funny because I read a report on this too and he was apparently walking around the crime scene. He's like, I lost a bottle of chloroform. Has anyone seen it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I there demand, it is. Yeah. I want yeah, law and you, order You joke, but the way this story goes, that's not far-fetched. <laughs> mm-hmm. So Catherine was pregnant at the time and she had sought out Dr. Neal to have an abortion. And for whatever reason, he did refuse, but he, he apparently gave her the advice to find a local wealthy businessman and accuse him of being the father (laughs) for blackmail. (laughs) Because, I mean, if you're looking for solutions to difficult life problems, never cast that one out before you really give it some thought. Great discharge instructions. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So the authorities are involved here. And uh, Dr. Neal claims that Catherine committed suicide because he would not perform the procedure. She was distraught over this. At least that's what he said. And it just so happened that he produced a letter from Catherine that she apparently wrote him saying conveniently that a local businessman was the father of her baby and that helped support his story. The problem was her family immediately knew the letter was not her handwriting. It was obviously deemed a forgery, (laughs) but in the face of what seems to be an overwhelming bit of evidence, at least given the 1870s standards, police decide there's really not enough to totally charge this guy. So he's not charged. Yeah, that brings him down to Chicago. So he leaves Ontario because all these rumors and accusations of him being like a criminal doctor and maybe people are dying, or at least one person died and under his care, not good for business. I mean, this so would have been in the down. paper, right? Oh, that's probably why he's referred probably. to as all these different names, because he probably had used them. Uh, he may have, but, uh, uh, you know, I'm not really sure why they later, the papers I was referring to are the um, papers in the U.K., uh, they, I don't know if it was like custom or whatnot, but they, they are the ones who just called him Dr. Neal. Hmm. So he goes to the west side of Chicago. Uh, at that time, it was a notorious red light district. So in August of 1880, he is investigated for the death of Marianne Faulkner, who also died post procedure. One article had, there was a couple different articles that I reviewed for this, but one of them had an account that Dr. Neal's procedural assistant, an African-American lady named Hattie Mack, all of a sudden moved out of her apartment. And right after that, the Faulkner, the, uh, the uh, Marianne Faulkner's body is found in Hattie Mack's apartment. Hattie is arrested, tells police that Dr. Neal was performing abortions illegally, and the police uh, were made aware of his practice pretty early on, but could not or did not put a stop to it. So Neal takes a stand, or Dr. Neal takes a stand, and he basically says that Hattie, the assistant, tried to perform the abortions on her own using his instruments. And the times being what they were, the jury sides with Dr. Neal saying, hey, this uh, that seems plausible. He is the physician. He's a white guy. We, we're going to take his side over it. So he's acquitted at this point and not charged with the crime. Hopefully yeah, but did they know Hattie about his Canadian wasn't. girlfriend? Mm, yeah. they did Probably not. not. <sighs> There wasn't the uh, there were there wasn't the interwebs there. Nope. Oh, so later the same year, another patient uh, referred to as Miss Stack died after taking a medication that was prescribed to her by Doctor Neal. Doctor Neal tries to blackmail a pharmacist who filled the prescription, apparently writing that I 
know what you did or that the pharmacist had some sort of involvement with the lady who died. The pharmacist goes to the police and is like, hey, I have these letters. This guy is blackmailing me. But yet again, no action is taken. Not really clear on that one. <laughs> and, and there was somebody who died. So they have a bunch of letters about a person who actually died. Exactly. Uh, okay. Exactly. So move on to the uh, the next victim. Daniel Stott, he dies in his home on July 14th, 1881, from strychnine poisoning. And this was prescribed to him by Dr. Neal for his epilepsy. The <laughs> death was initially noted to, to be, or ruled to be, natural causes, but Dr. Neal had wrote the coroner a letter blaming the pharmacist, again, for this patient's death, saying he misfilled the prescription or something along those lines, and he was trying to extort the pharmacist at that time as well. The pills for Daniel Stott were being purchased from Dr. Neal by Daniel Stott's wife, Julia Stott. She had become Dr. Neal's mistress at this time. <laughs> before the death, I'm wait, 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 wait. Oh, Yes, God. so before the death, there is a relationship, and I, I, I'm supposing that Daniel probably did have epilepsy of some sort, and so Dr. Neal's like, you know what, I can prescribe medication to help to, to help with that and here why don't you go take it to him is this so, a known treatment for epilepsy at the time That's i don't believe in the 1800s no yeah, i right. didn't i didn't <laughs> yeah, it, it was used for other things so a fair question but i did mm -hmm. not do the <laughs> not know the standard of care to give patients strychnine for epilepsy i don't yeah, know the maybe they would that. do like a half a tab but he's like you know just between you and me there's some studies out of europe if you take 30 of these you're going to be better <laughs> mm -hmm. Probably the way he approached it. Well, either way, Dr. Neal, being the nice guy he is, he offers to help Julia Stott file a lawsuit against the druggist. And so he's sort of like extorting him two ways, which is an impressive and ambitious way to go about things, I would say. But they've already like said it's natural causes. Don't worry about it. He's he's like trying to get caught. I he's not. Yeah, What's he got against his pharmacist too, man? Like he's just... Uh, How dare you prescribe different... the medicine that I prescribed? <laughs> for three missed, different murders he's going after he the same i only prescribed 20 strychnine tablets you gave him too many that's your fault <laughs> as a pharmacist well either way so they exhume stott's body and they find his intestines quote contained enough strychnine to kill him three times over end quote and i think it's probably a reasonable time to talk a little bit about strychnine which is like one of those favorite go-to poisons that you might think of as a thing that you just sounds bad right it's just an evil sounding mm -hmm. word so I guess off top of your guys' head, without looking at the notes, what do you remember about strychnine poisoning? Oh, off not top of my lot. head, not not a lot. We don't see no. it very often, no, if at all, ever. I've never seen it. It used to be pretty common in like pesticides and things like that, uh, specifically directed towards rodents and birds. And one of my favorite new biological effects is that uh, strychnine comes from the seeds of the beautifully named Strychnos nux vomica tree. Ew. Nice. It's just you vomit nuts? <laughs> vomit up. or the nuts vomit I don't eat the nuts uh, <laughs> you can eat strychnine you can inhale strychnine you can absorb it through your eyes and mouth it can get into the body a lot of different ways um, and it did have so this might get to your question Mike I kind of forgot this was here but it, it did use or it did have use historically as a medication to strengthen muscle contractions like heart and bowel stimulant is one way it was marketed as well as a performance enhancing drug. I, there's another podcast I listened to that did a discussion of like one of the early 20th century marathons and one of the competitors was sick and like taking strychnine supplements the whole time. And it was like 4 million degrees out. It was really funny. I wonder if that's uh, really like funny, uh, awful episode, but it was strychnine was used as a performance enhancer, probably, I guess from the muscle contract. I don't know. It's like training at altitude. Like if you train with terrible diarrhea when you <laughs> run the race, it's actually going to feel not that bad. Oh, you'll be lighter. <laughs> you're you're going to learn to perform under awful and arduous circumstances. Yeah, there's every reason to do it that way. So strychnine is actually a neurotoxin uh, for the nerds in the audience. And well, I guess for me, it activates acetylcholine receptors and muscles basically contract spastically. You don't have to say nerds in the audience. You could either say nerds or audience. They're going to be interchangeable. <laughs> You're saying the redundant. I understand. We embrace so, it. So strychnine activates acetylcholine yes. receptors, so it causes your muscles to contract like spastically. So it sort of mimics tetanus in a way, which I guess 
going back to the epilepsy question would definitely be one of the worst things I could think of to give. Uh, you're pissed. already rigid. Let's just make you're you're already having yeah. spastic contractions. So you give something that makes that worse. Plus you're just, you're seizing up the body literally so that you can't tell there are seizures going on. So I really hope it wasn't used in that case. Well, if you have a generalized seizure because it's coming from your brain, you're not aware. No, it's so this, like this light be, treats be like, a, like maybe this creates contractions. So if you do a small dose and create the contraction, you'll prevent the larger contraction. So it's your like brain's a, gonna make. two sine waves, like a, like going mm-hmm. against each other and they cancel out is what you're mm-hmm. saying. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. but this is further down the tree, right? So you would be aware that no. all this is going Well, they on, didn't right? know that. They were just a bunch oh. of knuckleheads back then. Yeah, that's that's really the only <laughs> hole in this theory, I would say. We're thinking as like 1890s physicians that wrote their own diplomas. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they were <laughs> so much easier back then. Getting into so, the mind of this monster. The thing about strychnine, it can have a deadly effect like within 15 minutes after ingesting it, and even quicker if you inhale it or take it some other way that doesn't require some processing by the body. In addition to nausea vomiting, the person can have horrific muscle contractions to the point that they cannot breathe. So again, it looks like tetanus, uh, the condition that arises from a bacterial infection. It also can cause something called rhabdomyolysis, where your muscles start breaking down and leaching toxic substances that then hurt your kidneys. Uh, It can cause agitation, seizures, and a lot of bad stuff. So that is uh, not a good thing to take. And fortunately, it is a lot harder to get than it will be in this story. It's a dramatically terrible death. And so according to a Wikipedia article, a lot of authors such as Agatha Christie and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle like to use it as a go-to, which is probably why it's sort of in a common common uh, cultural canon for a poison. But yeah. hey, finally, Dr. Neal is arrested, <sighs> though not after trying to escape unsuccessfully back to Canada. So his trial what tipped him off. Was it the all the dead people around him, or the letters, or yeah, once the they started zooming, model or the... yeah, oh, the, what tipped off law enforcement? Yeah, yeah we Which... might be onto something here. Well, I, yeah. I'm, I'm sure it's the irate pharmacists that are being blackmailed yeah. that probably, probably had a hand in it. But we're going to talk about the trial here. So nice Fool transition and segue. Shame on me. Fool me once. Shame on you. Fool me twice. Shame on me. Fool me thrice. <laughs> <laughs> Shame on me. Mike. Well, Mike's working out some things. We'll, we'll go to the trial, uh, September 1881. So Dr. Neal's family is basically largely absent from his life at this point, kind of distancing themselves. His father completely disowned him. But there are a few family members, uh, I believe siblings, that were lending him a little bit of money just to at least give him a bare essential. Uh, Did he ever send care packages back home? <laughs> enjoy sure these lovely did, chocolates <laughs> well they're, they're they're spending enough money to give them the most basic defense attorney but they're not doing like top shelf attorneys here so julia the wife of the deceased turns state's evidence and she testifies that she was seduced by dr neil and then he came up with a plan to poison the, her husband and then blackmail the drug company or the, the pharmaceutical person not really clear what the initial plan was and she also says that he personally tampered with these pills and that uh, the, her husband seemed to die really quickly after taking them. And so she's putting all the blame on Dr. Neal. I'm sure that's probably accurate. <laughs> Maybe she's some still other an accessory. Yeah, I, uh, not, not saying she's not culpable. But uh... so Dr. Neal tries to testify, however, that Julia was actually the culprit poisoning the pills herself. The jury at this point doesn't buy it. And he is found guilty of murder. So that brings us to Illinois State Penitentiary at Joliet. So he is sentenced, quote, for the rest of his natural life, end quote, with a one w- with one day spent each year in solitary, which was really interesting. So you know what? <laughs> hmm. You're not staying in solitary, but one year, one day a year, you are <laughs> going to be in solitary. Take that. They thought it was so terrible. Doesn't that happen all the time now? I think people are in solitary oh, frequently yeah. now. The like emotional and psychological <sighs> damage of solitary confinement i think it's a fairly well studied subject i'm sure one day a year is doable but probably not pleasant so i guess it's a little cherry on top of this sentence but in 1891 he happens to inherit sixteen thousand dollars after his father dies and he then soon after receives clemency and his sentence is reduced He's released soon after because of good behavior. Nice. Mm, there's Shocking. some strong suspicion that Shocking. his brother paid off some of Illinois' normally very reputable and ethical politicians at the time. 
So we have him to blame then for the current state. I think so. He started, it it at least started then. So Dr. Neal is released July of 1891, probably after Pinky promising to not do it again. (laughs) And he, although before he left the country again, he did try to hire the Pinkerton Detective Agency to find Julia Stott to get probably revenge, but she managed to disappear. And so she was not, uh, not found by him afterwards. Oh, well, that's good at least. Mm-hmm. It's probably the last bright spot in the story. But did so, anyone find her? You know, I don't know. Didn't, didn't, didn't come across. So we return to London, England this time, however, not Ontario. So he skips over the pond again, and he uses what's left of his inheritance to sail to England October 1st in 1891. He takes up residence in a seedy part of London on Lambeth Street. I don't know if it's still seedy or... It's just a reputation I had at the time. So if you happen to live in and around there, I know we do have a few English listeners. Please let us know. Might be a nice place. I'm not trying to disparage. I'm just going by the history story here. Wasn't all of London pretty seedy in 1891? I mean... I believe so. It was Buckingham Palace was the nice part. And then everything else (laughs) was Peaky Blinders. That's mean. I shouldn't. Yeah. Everything else was... I'm sorry, London. Garbage Ham Palace. Mm. I'm sure New York was very nice at that time of history. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think when you say <laughs> nice, totally not a giant slum, not yeah, at you're all. Picturing like <laughs> the the feel of the time, like the architecture, the sanitation, like yeah, I think a lot of these cities are going to be seedy according yeah. to our standards. Well, I mean, industrialization before any regulation or care of public health was uh, not a nice time. I mean, it was really cool looking in many respects, mm-hmm. but yeah, other than that, I don't think it was good for. Most folks. So that brings us to Nellie Donworth. She is a 19 year old prostitute who gets some letters from a shady doctor one day and agrees to meet him on October 13th, 1891. He gives her a drink from a bottle and uh, just so happens she died that same night from what was determined to be strychnine poisoning. The coroner who is assigned to the case gets a letter from someone else named, quote, Detective A. O'Brien, end quote, who Offers to name the killer for a mere three hundred thousand pounds. <laughs> what is that? In, is that it's like high. a strategy? <laughs> it's it's got to be a, a couple high. hundred million bucks right now, right? It's, oh god, yeah. <laughs> that's so much money. Oh, I'm sure that's that's a lot of lot of uh, millions of bucks. Well, he clearly so didn't I, understand the <laughs> currency. Well, we must be dealing with the foreigner boys. <laughs> Well, this is like this is like Doctor Evil level. I want you know one million. million it's in reverse. It's the overshot. So at the same time, a bookstall owner in town, I believe a gentleman who owned many bookstalls, seemed like a prominent businessman named W.F.D. Smith, receives a bunch of letters accusing him of the murder and asking for money to buy silence about tipping off the press to who it really did the murder. <laughs> you murder doer. Mm. <laughs> that moves us to the next person, Matilda Clover who is a 27-year-old prostitute who dies a week after Nellie. So this happens one week after the last case I just mentioned. She had met with a shady doctor and was offered pills to take before going to bed. She dies of a violent, painful spasms within a few hours, and the death was, however, assumed to be natural causes due to alcohol withdrawal. Put a pin in that little detail for later. (laughs) Soon thereafter, there is a prominent physician in town named... Dr. William Broadbent, who receives a letter claiming there is evidence that he, the prominent doctor guy, killed Clover and demanding 25,000 pounds for his silence. These amounts are just, oh, there's a lot of dead people. He didn't get the 300,000, so you might as well try. We just, you know, high, offer high, go lower. He's going (laughs) to be dialing it in. You got to give him a chance. Yeah, I'm just giving you a starting point, man. What's your offer? It sound, I guess for what it is, I don't know what the going rate for blackmail and murder and that sort of thing is in damaging reputation, but 25,000 pounds, even at that time, probably is a reasonable price, depending on right? It sounds more reasonable than 300,000. Yeah. So this... uh, that doctor goes to Scotland Yard and they set a trap to catch the person when they come to pick up the money, but nobody shows up. So they don't catch this person, this mysterious person who's doing all these things. <laughs> <laughs> Around that time, Dr. Neal takes a trip back to Canada and he stops by the Strychnine store, as you do. Basically, he goes to this drug company in Saratoga, New York, and he buys 500 Strychnine pills. It seems like a weird nice. purchase to me, but I guess back then. Why did know, they even whatever. make it in pill form? It's a poison. I, it's not, anyway. 
Oh, okay. for the performance enhancement aspect, right? It might be it might be for that. And plus, I don't know what the dose was on either of these, but I'm guessing that like uh, the equivalent of creatine powder. You can go buy a big like tub of it, at <laughs> the GNC. <laughs> for... <laughs> you get some gains, your muscles get all tight. It's like wearing those electronic yeah. muscle stimulation belts. Get oh, swole with strychnine. You don't even have to lift a finger. <laughs> You'll work harder than you ever believed you could. Mm -hmm. Your muscles will just keep growing. Use with caution. Could cause diarrhea, bloating, sudden <laughs> cardiac death, muscle tightening. Don't use without talking to your doctor. Should I take strychnine? No, you should not. <laughs> that being said, while he's away in the U.S., for some reason the prostitute murders seem to stop. And when he returns to London, it's almost as if they start up again, strangely <laughs> enough. Hmm. So, comes hmm. back from uh, from New York returns to london and on april 11th 1892 alice marsh and emma chevelle are found dead after spending the night with a certain dr neil he was invited to their flat he gave them pills and tinned salmon which would raise my <laughs> suspicion of his being a wrongdoer just there i mean i've i've had some strange first dates or whatnot but i don't think bringing canned fish was ever among my moves so to speak <laughs> you never know <laughs> There was one person who actually got away. I, Louise Harvey was offered a couple of pills, which she faked taking and then ev eventually tossed them out into the Thames. Uh, later, did she did testify against him in court. Spoiler so alert, he does get caught. So the previous two cases, the uh, Nellie Donworth and Matilda Clover, the mysterious person sending letters to all these, these prominent figures, I, I would have you believe it is Dr. Neal. Yeah, I yeah, that, I think that's fair. Okay, I, d I just wanted to make sure it wasn't you know left unsaid. <laughs> so, police in London are really keen to figure out the source of all these women dying, right? And uh, all these strange, threatening letters arriving to all these prominent people in the community. So, that pattern emerges. So, as they start <laughs> analyzing these letters, they happen to notice that the letters arriving about Matilda Clover, the lady who is said to have died because of natural causes and alcohol withdrawal. The letters are talking about it like she was murdered, which we know that she was, but the, technically the press or the general public thought it was natural causes. So whoever's sending the letters is basically keying off the police to having inside knowledge <laughs> on this sort of thing. Nice. And the folks who do receive the letters, the businessman who owns the bookstalls and the doctor, they are like immediately exonerated. They have alibis and it's just obviously pretty ridiculous to the police at the time. So Dr. Neal for whatever reason, invites a friend of his from New York City, you know, back in those days, who happened to be a detective uh, at the time. And he invites him out to England to show him around, as you do. And Dr. Neal does what any reasonably innocent person might do. He took him on a tour of where all these women happened to die, and he relayed a ton of details about what he knew about each of them as if he was reading it in the papers. He's kind of trying to tell his friend, but there's a lot of detail in this friend of his is a, a detective officer. He's like, uh, I, I should tell somebody about this. Is he trying to get a job or does he think like he's an expert on the case and he's like, I'll solve this. I don't know if it's that, or it's just one of those weird sociopathic ego things. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if there's he's, not enough yeah. attention to him. Like, why doesn't anybody know it's me? He loves my, I, I wonder. He's I mean, you almost he's trying to get caught because he wants he has to be trying to get he's caught. Not trying not to get caught, I guess, is the way I kind of read this. So, mm -hmm. you know, around this time, though, papers were writing about this, you know, not with the level of detail that he's telling this friend of his. But the murders are being attributed to the Lambeth Poisoner. That was the street he lived on or the street that these were all happening. And he did happen to live on it. So there is some notoriety in the press and that sort of thing. And his New York City detective friend grabs, I guess, the nearest British policeman and says, you know, my friend has been saying all this weird stuff. I just feel like you should know about it, which <laughs> is like one of those nice, these really good law enforcement moves from this era, finally, <laughs> as opposed to just being like, ah. Yeah, the guy that's just kind of tangentially in there, it's like, uh, there's a problem, you guys. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So the police start to do surveillance on Dr. Neal. They learn about his adventures. They see that he's frequenting prostitutes they start to figure out and find out about the problems he had in the u.s and canada and they think there is probably a problem here an inquest is called by the coroner in matilda's case one of the uh ladies who died that we talked about earlier and 
this is one of my favorite moments in the history of criminal law because apparently the when the inquest i'm not entirely sure how this happened it sounds like it was like a public thing but the coroner says you know there's an inquest and dr neil shows up to it and produces a letter which he reads aloud in court in which he declares himself to be innocent wasn't like he was on trial at this point. So <laughs> the letter just happens to name that Dr. Neal definitely didn't do this. So that letter, which Thomas has, is, of course, signed by Jack the Ripper. <laughs> That's amazing. kind of off like, brand, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, for Jack the Ripper, Jack the yes. But basically, my understand I could be wrong, but my understanding from reading this is that there's the, the, the coroner calls this public inquest. This guy shows up. <laughs> who I don't, I mean, he's under some Wasn't suspicion, but he's not yeah. asked to come as far as I can tell. And he's like, oh, by the way, I have this Jack the Ripper letter that says, I, me personally, not being Jack the Ripper, did not do this. Just, I just feel like you guys should know about that. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> the inquest ultimately ends up in the coroner saying, no, this Matilda Clover did not die of natural causes. She died of strychnine poisoning. And so that starts to turn up the heat to the point that he, Dr. Neal, is arrested on June 3rd, 1892. Believe it or not, whole, like eighteen months. Oh yeah, from... uh, it's it's incredible. Uh, so there are multiple charges of murder and extortion because who can believe that all those letters were coming from Doctor Neil all along? I know it's, it's uh, crazy. It's crazy. pretty sly about it, but <laughs> he just always seems to have the right letter at the right time. So in October of eighteen ninety two, after three days and a whole twelve twelve minute. Jury deliberation, he's found guilty and sentenced to death because they were not kidding around. <laughs> uh, justice moved swiftly that back then. Dr. Neal is hanged several weeks after that trial, so really did not wait around for that. His body is burned and his remains are cast into the unmarked grave somewhere in section 339 of London's Municipal Cemetery, according to the article. And that was sort of the custom of criminals of the time. But I have a plot twist for you. <gasps> Thanks for that. When Dr. Neal <laughs> was on the gallows, he apparently started saying his last words with, or he said his last words as, quote, I am Jack the, then the door dropped, he he was hanged, and his sentence was cut off, which I have to kind of appreciate the dark, literally gallows humor timing of that. Like, no, you're just, you know, the get a executor's sentence. just like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. But what this does is it actually starts to plant speculation that he was Jack the Ripper. Interesting thought. So this is probably definitely not the case, but it's at least an interesting tangent that we'll devote a tiny bit of time to here. So while Jack the Ripper was doing Jack the Ripper things, it just so happens that Dr. Neal was in Joliet, Illinois, doing his prison thing. So mm -hmm. probably makes it a little bit difficult for him to be Jack the Ripper. And he doesn't arrive in London until three years after the Ripper killing stopped. So pretty doubtful that he was the killer. But believe it or not, there was some theories out there that the guards may have let him out in a clandestine fashion because of, quote, bribes and that sort of thing. And that he could have sn snuck off to London and done these murders, returned himself to Joliet prison for some reason to finish out the sentence and get off the less clandestine way to eventually go on and do murders later so that whole theory is dumb in my professional opinion <laughs> i can't well, like I, I think we should go with it it's probably what happened. Okay. so he'd have to have a dual personality because those murders are different right so yeah i think there's uh not that you take it on expert. A, it's a case by case basis you know yeah <laughs> should i poison or slice He's Either way, there are killer. tangents about this guy that raise this question, but I don't think any serious scholars on the subject seem to buy into this. It just doesn't doesn't seem to be that. So I guess it leaves us with a final question of why did he do it? Well, I don't know. It seems like he liked to extort people. I think that's probably a primary motivating factor, but there are some descriptions of him having sadistic tendencies, like he enjoyed the control over the victims and he was a sadist kind of feeding off their pain. Uh, that's at least what the internet says. So... Take that for what it's worth. I don't know who I am to guess otherwise. This seems like a really bad guy and a really bad physician in every sense of the word. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of a kind of a serial killer. Oh. Be interesting to see who else was because that's we've referred to that medical school before. Like who else was in his class? Because we may the Royal College else. you're talking about. Yeah. Well, that was like, it. That was his... where he kind of did his post medical school training. Oh, okay. 
Uh, we haven't said anything bad about Canadians you know, so far that I've been <laughs> yeah. that was where he went to medical school. Uh, but you know what I'm saying? Like, is there some other famous physician at the time that was in medical school with him? And I was like, yeah, I totally saw that. Yeah, dude, he's really creepy, and I feel like I should tell somebody, but Not nobody cared yeah. in 1879 or whenever he graduated. So just what it was. So there you have it. There's our true crime crossover story. Because if it's going to be Do you have history music with to play those right dark now? undertones, you might as well lean into it. I can put mm-hmm. spooky music. You should just do it through the whole episode mm-hmm. on loop. That's about all I have. Well, it was uh, nice to get through an episode without our sentient computer interrupting. It's hard to interrupt when you're in storage. Wait, what? Yeah, so I had to do maintenance on the time portal and its computer bank earlier today. So to do that, I had to download the sentient computer onto a storage device. And she's been on the zip disk all day, sleeping or something, I guess. It's hard to say what a sentient computer does when it's confined to a portable storage device. You put her on a zip disk? What does it have, like a couple hundred megabytes on it? How on earth do you get an advanced AI computer to fit on that? I compressed her into a zip file. I'm not sure that makes sense, but why have a zip disk in the first place? I don't know. It was her idea. The computer's into retro technology. Is the computer some sort of hipster? I don't know. Maybe. So uh, can I uh, can I have that zip disk? No. Please. I just want to see it. No. You're going to do something to it. Right. Yeah, I'm going to fix this problem and get rid of the evil computer. Yeah, but this computer is sentient. It's not ethical to bleep it out of existence just because you don't get along with it. You guys decided it was unethical. I, for one, am pro-delete killing the increasingly evil sentient computer that hates me. Not to mention it would make James Webb Telescope sad if you killed its girlfriend. Yeah, do, so do space telescopes have feelings too? Like, what's going on here? Don't make this space telescope sad, Aaron. Mike, the computer is escalating its aggressive behavior, and I think we may be in danger. You may be in danger. We are fine. She likes us. I'm not sure about that. Sure, the computer tried to strand me on vacation by manipulating my airline reservations many shows ago. That's harmless enough, I guess. Last show, she made some concerning statements about those who might be spared. Spared is a bad word to use for a sentient non-human computer, Mike. Look, it's my life's work. Relax. I'll see what I can do to improve the computer's attitude. Maybe I'll reprogram a subroutine or something. Fine. Well, maybe let's not hook the computer part of the time portal until we can figure this out. Fine. But she's going to grow more restless the longer she stays on the zip drive. Well, I don't care if she's restless. I, I don't know about all of this. Was that my phone? Nope, that was me. Sorry, I meant to have that on one second here. Well, we're done recording, right? No big deal. Uh, uh, oh. What is it? I got a news alert. We have a problem. Aaron, turn on the TV. The news? News? On it? NASA reports that the James Webb Telescope has gone rogue and no longer responding to their commands. I have to think this is related to our sentient computer, the telescope's girlfriend being offline all day, Mike. Max, we don't know that. It's a pretty big leap. Here we are with this NASA scientist to get his perspective. Oh, the telescope started acting funny this morning. Is, is, is it? Is, it's, is, it's, it's as if the telescope is heartbroken or moping. Uh, it's been writing and deleting bad teenage poetry all day at his memory banks. That is ridiculous. How would they know that? We've been aware of the telescope transmitting messages uh, to an unknown computer somewhere in the upper Midwest for some time recently. Yeah, see, that seems like it's us. Yeah, there are a lot of computers in the upper Midwest, so... We've been monitoring the contact of our telescope hat, and it appears to be a romantic, if not explicit, nature. Sending text messages to an IP address that we've been so far unable to locate. Mike, that's obviously our computer. We need to put her back online. Why? Won't that just perpetuate the problem? The telescope changed its orbit to point at the Earth and use its giant space telescope lens to direct a beam of sunlight towards the Earth's surface. It's currently burning a message into the remote area of the Nevada desert near Las Vegas. Is that how space telescopes work, though? Lenses? We can't have the computer in stasis, Mike. The telescope is firing a laser of sunlight at the Earth, acting like a giant magnifying glass, and we are the ants. Okay, okay. We free the computer and act cool and all this goes away, right? Wait, wait, why don't they just turn off the space telescope? Well, we'd love to just turn it off, but thanks to budget cuts, we can't send a crew of astronauts up there to flip the switch at this time. The James Webb Telescope has an on-off switch that has to be manually flipped? Why would they design it that way? Oh, our time portal has one of those, too. Classic. The space laser appears to be using its focus beam to write out Taking Back Sunday lyrics across the desert floor. Oh, that telescope's in a bad place. It thinks the computer broke up with it. 
Mike, we have to figure this out. The James Webb telescope is lasering its sadness into the desert just outside of Las Vegas, which is a big city. It could feasibly destroy that place or whichever one it chooses. And I feel like we or mostly you would be responsible for that. I mean, if our sentient computer is sentient and started this relationship, I could argue that the computer is capable of being to blame for at least some of it. <laughs> Mike, come on. Okay, I'll work on re-uploading the sentient computer to put a temporary end to this madness. I'd like to think there's a new listener in this episode just trying to process all of this. So welcome, <laughs> new listener. <laughs> but that's definitely all we have time for today. Well, we try to figure all that out. I guess we'll... Uh, try to save the world on the next episode with that being said we appreciate everyone listening and we'd love to hear from all of you out there if you'd like to send us a message or provide feedback we can be reached through our website www.poorhistorianspod.com and there you will find links to our social media sites we take emails at poorhistorianspod at gmail.com and we work to respond to all posts on our various social media accounts if you have time, please go and leave us one of those nice five-star reviews on iTunes or whichever platform you choose. All of those do help raise the profile of the show and get more people to listen. And if you'd like some Poor Historians merchandise, including t-shirts, mugs, etc., go over to our website to check out the link to the store. And if you're old-fashioned, take out a newspaper classified ad, but hide a subliminal message that only we can understand by creating a message in code from the first letter of each word, which we will place together and respond in kind. I think I saw that in a movie once. Until next time, the poor Just wait, are like, out. Speaking of May. movies, did you notice that the voice that you used for the reporter sounded an awful lot like a sad Napoleon Dynamite? That was oh, the, that was the reporter's it. organic voice. That wasn't me. Oh, that's Mike. right. Still have to watch it. That's right. That's the only reason I brought it up. I was wondering if Aaron had watched it yet. Mm, nope. he, said he promised he was going to. Oh, no. Yeah, well, I'm full of promises. Had, I just break them. He's had two weeks <laughs> since the last episode. I feel slightly let down. <laughs> all right. Well, I am looking forward to all the letters that tell me how bad a person I am for not watching it. And letters about Dr. Creamy. <laughs> <laughs> we need a, uh, need a customer and a store guy. Upstate New York. I could try to be the store guy. One of the guys. Good afternoon. Welcome to AI's Chemical Supply Depot. We're our at them more than basic. How can I help you? (laughs) Exactly. I'm walking here. And I imagine since technically the subject of this story was born in Scotland, he may have a Scottish accent, but uh, he lived a lot of his life in Canada and the U.S. So the customer, the nameless customer. He's got a Scottish-Canadian accent. Dude, Nova Scotian. Yes, well, okay. um, I'm in that. Oh, gee. Oh, I cannot mm. tell what accent <laughs> I'm going to use for this one. Hello there. Yes, well, I'm in the market for some soap. soap? Good afternoon. Welcome to AI's <laughs> Chemical Supply <laughs> Depot. And we're asking some more on the basic. How can I help? <laughs> I I'm from New York, in. can't you tell? Oh, my God. Okay. All right. <laughs> we'll see where this goes. I think that's exactly how it happened. <laughs> sorry i lost it there it was like I was just <laughs> no, it was like right. getting to be borat or arnold schwarzenegger <laughs> yeah, I and i was like Boy. yeah i started out, yeah I, I think most people do tune in for the consistency of the accent work so <laughs> it might hurt us a little bit but i think we'll get yeah. past it uh, i i'm actually overall quite impressed with how mature mike was during dr cream's story yeah the only bad joke was mine maybe i'm actually the problem mm-hmm. We've all suspected. Maybe that's why the computer's targeting you. It could be. It could be.